Hey everybody, it's Elizabeth with World's Cup of Joe, Awaken Your Soul. Today I am bringing you the start of a variation of our Soul Through Literature series. It is going to be called Soul Love Through Literature. And it is where I'm going to argue the case that certain characters in novels that many of us are familiar with are actually part of a twin flame connection. I will start with Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, a fabulous book. If you have not read it, it is extraordinary. And I will be making the case that Jane and Mr. Rochester are actually part of a twin flame union. So with that being said, let's begin this series. I hope you enjoy it and I hope you stay with us each week while we figure out together if um, Jane and Mr. Rochester are part of a twin flame. Introduction. At the beginning of the year, one of my goals for myself was to read more books. In all my spiritual and personal growth over the last year and a half, one area I had neglected was my love of reading. So I determined that I would make a more concerted effort to read and I wanted to start with a Victorian genre because the authors of that period wrote in such a manner that I could feel my soul sing when I read their words. I chose the book Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte just to compare her works to Jane Austen. I had read a few of Austen's novels, and I loved them all, and wanted to see if Bronte would inspire the same emotional response from me that Austen could. Not only did her book spark the same love of Victorian writing, but I felt like this book may move up to my all-time favorite novel that I had read. Yes, it really was that good. Being in a twin flame connection, I don't search out for this type of connection when I read or watch television, but something about Jane Eyre spoke to me and seemed to whisper in my ear that the union between Jane and Mr. Rochester was one of a twin flame. There was something that stirred so deep within me telling me that this was not an ordinary soulmate relationship between the two of them. There was something way more unique and magical about their connection. Initially, with my own bias, I looked to Jane to be the positive polarity because it is much more common for a female to be the push in the connection. But she didn't exhibit the traditional addictive energy so easily identifiable with the positive polarity. So I shut the initial thought down and just kept reading the book. This question of if or if they weren't in a soul connection still weighed on me even after I finished the book. There was something so transcendental about their relationship that I would lay in bed at night and think about specific traits, behaviors, and reactions of each character. And that is when it hit me. It was not Jane that was the positive polarity, but rather Mr. Rochester. It was like a light bulb went off and the puzzle pieces finally fit together perfectly for me and confirmed my initial feeling that this was indeed a novel about a twin flame union. Keep in mind when I discuss my assertion that they are in a twin flame connection that this book was written in 1847. That means Bronte had no access to the internet and even though the concept was touched upon for a couple of thousands of years in various literary works like Plato's Symposium in the 5th century BC, The term itself wasn't even coined until the 1970s by Elizabeth Clare Prophet. Bronte created this duo without modern day knowledge of what twin flame characteristics of each polarity were, and she was quite accurate. Any resemblance to a twin flame union that I distinguished from this book was something that I personally could identify with, myself being in a soul union with my other half. I will discuss my findings and leave the verdict up to you to decide if you agree with me or not that Jane Eyre is a novel about a twin flame union. Part 1. First Encounter The first part of the story that I will try and dissect is when Jane and Mr. Rochester first meet and get to know each other. If you haven't read the book, keep in mind that these two don't even meet until about 100 plus pages into the story. The initial part of the book is about Jane's childhood and events that led her to become a governess for the daughter of Mr. Rochester. She had worked as the governess for Darling Adele for a couple of months before Mr. Rochester returned to his estate 
and met Jane for the first time. This is where I'll start the series at the point where the two meet. It is my opinion that Mr. Rochester had soul recognition early on, but as a male, the addictive energy was not expressed in the same way that I often encounter women to show it. His energy was a bit more masked and guarded, but I believe it was still activated upon their initial meeting, if not soon thereafter. Let me describe the backdrop of their meeting before I get to the quotes from the story. Like I mentioned, Jane had been employed by Mr. Rochester for a couple of months, although he had been out of the country during her initial tenure. She had decided to get out of the house and go to town to drop off mail, and it was on her return journey that she unexpectedly met Mr. Rochester. She didn't know who he was, nor did he immediately tell her. He was traveling to his home while Jane was walking, and his horse had an accident and he was thrown to the ground with an injury that made it hard for him to get up. This is where Jane comes in to assist. Rereading specific passages of the interactions between the two, it appeared that Mr. Rochester was exhibiting addictive energies early on, but to an average reader, it would just seem more of a short temper and impatience. But I would argue that the emotion behind his responses were one of an energetic desire for her. I want you to judge for yourself. Jane, on the other hand, seemed quite indifferent about their initial meeting. She holds all of the qualities of a negative clarity, indifference and at ease, while the positive was emotionally aroused and visibly shaken. First quote, I felt no fear of him and but little shyness. Had he been a handsome, heroic looking young gentleman, I should not have dared to stand thus questioning him against his will and offering my services unasked. I had a theoretical reverence and homage for beauty, elegance, gallantry, fascination. But had I met those qualities incarnate in masculine shape, I should have known instinctively that they neither had nor could have sympathy with anything in me and should have shunned them as one would fire, lightning, or anything else that is bright but antipathetic. When Jane first meets Mr. Rochester, she remarks that she wasn't intimidated by him, nor did she feel shy around him. She didn't think he was handsome because if she had, she would have never been able to speak to him so freely. She would have had an aversion to him and not been willing to help. Being around masculine beauty to her was like being too close to a fire. She would have looked with wonder, but wouldn't want to get too close. But because Mr. Rochester didn't spark anything in her, therefore she was eager to try and help him. Now this next quote, I want you to really pay attention to the way that Jane describes Mr. Rochester and his reaction to her. It is in his reaction that I can see traces of addictive energy come, come out, the lower energy vibration of anger. Often as the positive polarity, we will be quick to anger because the negative polarity creates all these triggers within us to be released. That is what I sensed happened here with Mr. Rochester, and it is not clear until you take it into evidence and context along with the rest of the story. So bear with me and keep listening along. Second quote. If even this stranger had smiled and been good humored to me when I addressed him, if he had put off my offer of assistance gaily and with thanks, I should have gone on my way and not felt any vocation to renew inquiries. But the frown, the roughness of the traveler set me at my ease. I retained my station when he waved me to go. Jane offers to help Mr. Rochester up after he's been thrown off the horse and has injured his leg. He not only refuses, but he does so with anger. To most readers, they may just chalk it up to him being embarrassed and annoyed, maybe even pass it off as misogynist behavior of not wanting help from a female. But in knowing how the rest of the story unfolds, meeting her incited him to want to release some fear-based energy. Whether it was at this point or not that he had soul recognition is unclear, but if it didn't happen immediately, it was soon to follow. His demeanor and emotions were those on the lower scale of consciousness. He was acting out of mind, but Jane didn't get intimidated by this anger he projected onto her. Instead, she says it put her at ease and made it where she wanted to stay and offer her help. Now, I'm not shocked by Jane's behavior of wanting to stay. Mr. Rochester was not in a needy state. Therefore, the energy allowed her to want to be near him. Look what she says at the beginning. If he would have been in good humor and a place of gratitude and thanks with her, she would have left him. But instead, when he doesn't want her there, she was inclined to stay. 
Now, understand in a twin flame connection, when the positive polarity puts the negative on a pedestal, it actually repels them. But Mr. Rochester didn't do this with Jane. Isn't that typical of a twin flame runner? When the push wants or needs you, they are nowhere to be found. But if the push is in a place of self-sufficiency, the runner is right there waiting for you. Even after this incident, Jane is seemingly indifferent about meeting Mr. Rochester. She says the following after she leaves him. Next quote. The incident had occurred and was gone for me. It was an incident of no moment, no romance, no interest in a sense. Yet it marked with change one single hour of a monotonous life. My help had been needed and claimed I had given it. I was pleased to have done something, trivial, transitory though the deed was. It was yet an active thing and I was weary of an existence all passive. She talks about meeting Mr. Rochester as if the only thing important about it was that it passed an hour of her day differently than most of the boring hours she typically engaged in. The incident didn't spark anything within her except that she was able to help someone out that she felt needed her help. She describes herself as one that is always wanting to do and not just sit by and be a passive observer. For her, she needs to be an active participant in her surroundings. Her meeting, in my opinion, her other self, was quite unremarkable. A reader would believe that he didn't make any impression on her whatsoever, except she gives it away in the next line when she thinks. Next quote. The new face, too, was like a new picture introduced to the gallery of memory and it was dissimilar to all the others hanging there. Firstly, because it was masculine, and secondly, because it was dark, strong, and stern. I had it still before me when I entered Hay. I saw it as I walked fast downhill all the way home. Jane gives her poker hand away when she makes the comment that the face of Mr. Rochester was now imprinted in her memory and unlike all others there. I will say as a positive polarity, meeting my twin flame, there was instant soul recognition. The addictive energy was activated from the first day I met him. It was instantaneous. Now for him, as a negative polarity, there was of course no addictive energy, but there was an immediate attraction. Within a couple of days, he had already told me that I was unlike anyone he had ever met before, that I was everything he had ever wanted in a person, which of course I was because I was him. So when Jane explains that Mr. Rochester stood out differently than everyone else she'd ever met, it's not surprising. She knew something about him was unique and she held on to this image of him while walking home. The last line of the quote, she mentions that she had thought about him the entire way home. Even as she had entered the estate, she was still picturing him and the image of him made her walk faster than normal. This quote gives away that she was drawn to him. She walked fast because she was excited. Something within her had been stirred and awakened, but she was unclear as to what it was. In fact, she goes to lengths to say how indifferent she was with the entire meeting, but why is it then she is so drawn to him? It's because he is her other half. He is her soul. This is where we will end for today. The next episode, we will discuss their next meeting and how their connection progresses and see if you can spot the unfolding and revealing of them being in a twin flame connection. Thank you for joining me. This is Elizabeth with World's Cup of Joe. Awaken your soul.